Well, good evening. This is Hound Dog Steve wishing you a very pleasant evening. And I hope you had a great long weekend. This was the Labor Day weekend here in Canada. And uh, I know that the um, fall doesn't arrive until the 21st of September. But really, the Labor Day weekend is basically heralding the beginning of a fall weather. And uh, what a better moment to talk about the eruption of Volcano Shivluch in Russia. Uh, this was a massive massive eruption. Uh, it fired um, ash 70,000 feet or 21 and a half kilometers into the atmosphere and uh, so now that is up in the stratosphere and that means that it will be blocking out the Sun partially this winter. So you can expect an absolutely brutally cold winter in the northern hemisphere. Uh, this volcano has been rumbling for quite a while now. Uh, it is an unstable volcano and uh, we haven't seen an eruption like this for over uh, 10 years. And it is interesting because I'm just going to flip over the article in a minute so you can take a quick peek. Uh, but they say that it is a diminishing of coronal holes and solar activity. And of course this is what Dr. Heinrich Svenmark said about um, the increase in cosmic rays affect volcanoes and earthquakes. Okay, so let's flip over that article and then we'll come back because they have two stories for you this evening. Um, completely different stories, but they are linked by climate and the environment. Okay, here we go. And here we are from Electroverse and this is Shivaluch. Ash fired 70,000 feet, 21.3 kilometers, VEI uh, five to six confirmed global cooling. The recent strong explosive activity at Kamkatcha Shivaluch volcano in Russia climaxed over the weekend as a VEI 56 monster of an eruption rocked the mountain, and there's likely more to come. The Volcanic Ash Advisory Center, Anchorage, reported on a volcanic ash plume rising to a staggering 70,000 feet, 21,300 meters, and moving at 10 knots in a north-northeast direction. Particulates ejected to altitudes above 32,800 feet, 10 kilometers, and into the stratosphere have a direct cooling effect on the planet. This eruption at Shivaluch produced a huge stratospheric injection, says Diamond, of the Oppenheimer Ranch project. We're talking Plinian or Ultra Plinian, one of the largest eruptions of the last decade. This baby is not over. Shivalush is an unstable stratovolcano with a recent eruptive history littered with VEI 4s and 5s, but even still this year's activity culminating with this weekend's big boom represents a tremendous uptick. Okay, so here is uh, Shevelush, uh, and uh, you can see this is Russia here. So, Shevelush has erupted here, and we have north northeast, which is kind of th th this direction. Okay, so it's going to go up over Alaska and all over North, of, north America this winter. Brr, I can feel it already. And a Plinian eruption, by the way, in case you wondered, Plinian eruptions or Vesuvian eruptions are volcanic eruptions marked by the similarity to the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD, which destroyed the ancient Roman cities of Herculaneum and Pompeii. The eruption was described in a letter written by Pliny the Younger after the death of his uncle, Pliny the Elder. Now, my second story is an interesting story as well. It is a story about a Dr. Ball and a Dr. Man. Uh, but these are both climate scientists, except one is an alarmist and the other is a skeptic. So Dr. Man, the alarmist, had created a graph which shows the climate acting a lot like a hockey stick. And uh, climate skeptic Dr. Ball uh, basically took the readings from the ice core, Greenland ice core samples, um, I'm assuming because it looks exactly the same as the graphs I've been looking at, and they completely contradicted Dr. Mann's uh, findings. Uh, so Dr. Mann sued Dr. Ball uh, in a defamation lawsuit, and he lost. Uh, the court upheld Mr. Ball's finding, and that... Um, Dr. Mann had basically used fraudulent science, had cherry-picked the numbers to basically create the kind of graph that would look 
very alarmist and scare the bejabers out of you. Anyway, let's pop over to that letter from Zero Hedge and uh, then we'll come back and I'll do a quick wrap up. Okie dokie, here we go. So here we are from Zero Hedge, a climate alarmist sued a skeptic for defamation and lost. The Supreme Court of British Columbia recently dismissed a defamation lawsuit by celebrity climate scientist Dr. Michael Mann against global warming skeptic climatologist Dr. Tim Ball. Mann must pay the full legal cost to the defendant. The ruling is explosive because it means that Ball's claim that Mann was a scientific fraudster is now supported by the court. And this is Michael Mann's version where you see he's erased the medieval warm period and the little ice age and makes the warming look like a hockey stick. So there is a crisis whereas actually it's flattening out and we're going to start to cool again. Background. In 1999, Mann published a thousand year long global temperature reconstruction from tree rings that severely undercut the then accepted knowledge of climate. IPCC's 1995 second assessment report acknowledged that it was warmer during the medieval warm period than today and that a significant cooling called the Little Ice Age followed and lasted until the end of the 19th century. Mann's reconstruction demolished that view and replaced our climate history with something that looks like a hockey stick. For 900 years the temperature was slightly falling, straight line and then, during the period of human activity, rapid warming in the 20th century. Climate catastrophists immediately seized on this persuasive graph and made man the poster boy of the IPCC which was now thoroughly controlled by radical greens appointed by leftist politicians. The Wegman graph. There is only one problem with the graph. It was junk science. Future university courses in statistics will undoubtedly teach the hockey stick as a classic case of faulty mythology. In layman's terms, man was using a statistical technique that cherry-picked the data needed to make the hockey stick shape. In 2006, Congress commissioned three statisticians, led by Dr. Edward Wegman, to produce the so-called Wegman Report on the controversy. The report proved that the technique man used could create any desired outcome and demonstrated this fact by creating the shape of the global temperatures data from 1995. If Mann had produced this graph in a graduate thesis in statistics, he would have flunked. Hiding the decline. Canadian engineer Stephen McIntyre spent several years after the publication of the hockey stick graph trying to prove that it was faulty. He ultimately prevailed, but during this debacle, Mann engaged in what many have described as intellectually dishonest or even fraudulent behavior. He refused to release the full data and source files that he used in his infamous 1999 publication. In 2011, Tim Ball summarized this by stating that Michael Mann belonged in a pen, not in Penn University. This statement was the basis for Mann's defamation lawsuit. Ball defended his remark by saying that if Mann released his data, it would prove that he was a fraudster. Nine years of delay tactics later, the court dismissed the case because Mann refused to release the data that could prove his honesty. While this technically is not a victory for Ball, it is hard to imagine a legitimate reason for a tax-funded scientist to refuse to release the data upon which the global climate disaster narrative largely rests. Dubious Science under normal circumstances, Mann's career would have been lying in a pool of utter disgrace long ago. Instead, he is still one of the leading scientists in the climate catastrophe mafia. His colleagues had to defend him because if they ever were to admit that the hockey stick graph is junk science, it would discredit the IPCC and the entire field of paleoclimatology that hailed Mann's result. They have doubled down and used political pull and a friendly media to the scandal. So far they have succeeded, but for every year the gap between the climate models and the reality is widening. At some point, nothing can hide the shaky ground upon which the climate hysteria stands. And this from Liberty Nation. Truth is making a comeback. Well, what do you know? The hockey stick graph and other notable frauds. The most famous case of such biased findings was a study published in 1999 by Dr. Michael Mann. It showed 900 years of flat temperature followed by 100 years of rapid warming. Its shape quickly led it to be nicknamed the hockey stick graph and it played a key role in the 2001 United Nations Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change third assessment report. 
It is perhaps the most important graph in the history of science because it was instrumental in scaring the living daylights out of politicians. Until that study, the climate skeptics were on a par with the global warming alarmists. The science debate was still raging and no definite winner had been declared. After politicians saw that graph, they were convinced that humans were destroying the climate. Without it, the Paris Climate Agreement and the Green New Deal would be unthinkable. The problem is that it was a bogus study constructed in much the same manner as the hypothetical luck journey of lottery winners. Man had the equivalent of millions of lottery tickets at his disposal and so he was guaranteed to find whatever result he was looking for. Now you will note uh, in the Chinese study that I did a video on recently and this all say that the sun, the atmosphere, the Gulf Stream and the jet stream are the major influences of weather changes on our planet. It's got nothing to do with human activity. And let me just give you an idea of how complex uh, it is on this planet when you were looking at weather. Let's just take a little look at some air currents and some wind currents. And I think you'll see immediately as I take you through these uh, why it's a lot more complex than you might think. Now I'm sure, like most of you, I used to think that the Gulf Stream was like a river. And of course you could be forgiven of that because this is how it's normally depicted. And so you see the Gulf Stream here, uh, the subtropical recirculation it's called, and uh, also some warm water coming up from Africa. So this is what it looks like. This is the normal representation that we see. And here is the Gulf Stream here. Goes up into the Gulf of Mexico, out again up the east coast of the US and meets the cold water coming down from Greenland and here is where it starts to descend. Uh, it goes down along the African coast and starts to rise up again and continues in a big cycle. Okay, so I am going to zoom in a little bit now and just to show you how complex some of these systems are. So now you can see as we zoomed in, look at all of these little back switches, all these little eddies and currents. This uh, actually represents the speed with which the water is flowing. But, uh, you know, you can see it's a lot more complex than you might think at first thought comes up into the Gulf, warms up again, you see it's cooling here, warms up again, it's speeding up, up the East Coast. So let's really zoom in on this. Okay, so where the water gets cooler, it's still circulating. It is still all mixing all over the place, just not quite as fast. Now how do you get an average temperature from that? Okay, so this is the air systems, and it's the same thing. Here is the hurricane coming across the Florida border, just going over the Bahamas right now, right here. But look at all the different directions the wind goes in. How can you figure that out? We're on a planet. Do you know how big a planet is? It's huge. It's absolutely huge. Now this is an absolutely amazing site. It is earth.nullschool.net. I will leave the link below so you can go check this out. Uh, click on Earth and you have all the different um, ocean, air, currents, waves, sea surface temperature, sea surface temperature anomaly. Uh, it's all there. Okay, so let's just zoom in. This is, this is the Pacific now. And this is sea surface temperature. And again, you can see the amount of mixing that is taking place in the ocean. Now, to really truly understand what is happening on this planet at any one time, I would say is virtually impossible. Uh, it is just so big. It is just so big. And look at this temperature here. This is th about 31 degrees, this temperature. Anyway, I just want to give you an idea of how complex our system is. So I'm not even sure how anybody can come up with an average temperature on this planet. Uh, certainly one of the best things that we can do is to review history 
and now that we have core samples from Vostok, we have core samples from Greenland, and also we have sediment studies. Uh, the Chinese sediment study uh, in Moon Lake, there is a stalagmite study uh, which said the same things, and ocean sediment levels. And there's been lots of other, of course, lake sediment studies which show exactly the same thing as Mr. Ball's graph. Uh, I am just so tired of us being blamed for the whole CO2 thing. CO2 is meaningless. Okay, this is a tiny, 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 tiny portion of our atmosphere. Uh, it is 0.49% and it really makes no difference to the temperature on this planet except in a very minor way. But what it does do in a major way is it feeds our plants and our plants cannot live without carbon dioxide. So please, IPCC, go home. This is proven now in a court. And it just happens to have taken place in BC, British Columbia, and Canada. Now, British Columbia is probably the most left-leaning province in Canada right now. And so for the Supreme Court of BC to make this ruling in favor of the skeptic really says an awful lot about the whole global warming panic narrative. And I'll tell you, you better get yourself some long johns, some mitts, and some heavy duty wool socks because the sun is slowing down and we are most definitely going into a cooling period and with this Shivalich uh, eruption and I'm sure there are going to be several more eruptions from this volcano because, as I say, cosmic rays are now influencing our planet and um, goodness knows what we are going to see. Okay, well, I hope this didn't scare you too much, but uh, please, we have to think ahead. The cold is no joke. It's absolutely no joke. And as someone mentioned in my previous video, I got the temperature of space minorly wrong, but the point is... It is absolutely freezing out in space, whether it's minus 270 degrees Celsius or minus 280 degrees Celsius, uh, which is about minus 400 and something degrees Fahrenheit. That is pretty darn chilly. Okie dokie, so if you've enjoyed this video, please like, comment and subscribe below. Please share with your friends uh, if you think this information is worthwhile. And in the meantime, this is Hound Dog Steve signing off, wishing you a very pleasant evening, and we will talk very, very shortly. See you now. Bye.